Hello and welcome to Tech Deals, MediaSonic's 8-bay external USB 3.0 and serial ATA external hard drive enclosure, a bunch of hard drives, a controller card. What in the world is this video? Why should you watch and why should you care? Well, if you came here looking for a detailed, in-depth performance review of this enclosure, it won't be in this video. That will be coming up soon when I attach this to my new Skylake X build. Instead, this is an unboxing, an overview, and an in-depth conversation on why I have this, what I'm going to be using it for, and why I think this is actually worth the money even though you certainly could just plug all these external hard drives directly into your computer. Now, first, let me say this is absolutely not something that the average user needs. It is a specialized piece of equipment for somebody like myself or another professional type user who has a need for a large number of hard drives. I certainly do. My data storage use with my YouTube channel continues to grow and I need a place to put all of those files. I currently use four 8 terabyte hard drives that are installed in my Broadwell e-machine, my i7-6800K that you saw built on my channel last year in 2016. They are almost full and I need some more space. Now there is room in that computer to install two more drives, but that's just an interim solution. My data rate is continuing to grow and I really want to come up with a solution that will work for me for the next one to two years without having to make a lot of changes. I also want the data out of that machine so that I can move it from computer to computer and have it separate from the actual uh, computer, have the drives outside of the machine. There's reasons for this. I'll get into that in detail later in the video. But first, let me address the most obvious question some of you may have. Why spend $270 on an external 8-bay enclosure, actually a really good deal, cheapest 8-bay enclosure on the market as far as I know, when you could just take eight of these external hard drives, plug them into an 8-port hub, plug that into a USB port, and call it a day? Well, first of all, you could do that. You absolutely could get an 8-port hub, plug it into your computer, line these up, plug them all in, and it would in fact work. There are several reasons why you might not want to do that. First of all, eight identical drives, and I do have a bunch of these. I got them on Prime Day for a really good price. Eight identical drives all look the same, so you have to label them, but that's fine. You could put labels on them, but then you need a place to plug in eight different power adapters, and then you have all the different cables, and then what happens when you need more and you want to swap things around, and it becomes a mess at some point. It also becomes a space and storage issue. This is a single enclosure that you can put next to your tower. It's fairly straightforward. There is one cable that runs from the back of this, either a USB 3 or a SATA port to an external SATA port on your, that's what this is for, for an external SATA port on the computer. And then if you need to add eight more drives, you simply get a second one. This controller card has two external serial ATA ports. You don't need this strictly. You could absolutely plug these into a USB 3. But now you can have 16 drives if you want to expand it with two of them in a relatively small footprint. Imagine trying to organize and plug in 16 separate external drives with 16 power adapters. It does become a bit unwieldy at a certain point. Another issue to consider is performance. Two of these external enclosures plugged into external serial ATA are going to have a very low CPU utilization when accessing all those drives. Trying to access software RAID on 16 external USB 3 drives, the CPU overhead would be terrible. Furthermore, there is in fact a limit to how many USB devices you can plug in your computer. It's fairly generous. I found that limit. My Broadwell e-machine that I built last year it has a very nice $250 motherboard. It is the X99-A2 ASUS motherboard. I did run into the limit. You can, in fact, only plug so much into all the various USB ports. I have a bunch of external drives plugged in now. I have a bunch of other devices. And then finally, Windows simply refused to accept any more. Rearranging devices, plugging things in the front ports, the back ports, etc. Now, I got around this to a certain extent by adding in a PCI Express card, which added another USB controller chip. But if you're going to do that, put one of these in. Serial ATA data access does have lower CPU utilization than USB access does, which does drive off of the CPU, whereas this uses DMA and it is more CPU efficient. When you start getting into more than a dozen plus hard drives, it makes a difference. Like I said in the beginning of this video, this challenge is not the average user's challenge. 
But this is where I'm at with my channel. What do I do with all the data? How do I keep it organized in one place? How do I make the solution easy and manageable on an ongoing basis? It's not just setting it up in the first place, but it's living with it over the days, the weeks, and the months. In just a minute, I'm gonna to describe to you what my current storage situation is, and it is a mess with drives across four different machines. This is going to change, and I'm actually excited to have it all in one place to make it much easier to organize my storage. First, let me talk about the drives here. These are Seagate 8 terabyte external archive hard drives. Why not internal drives? Because the external drives for some reason are much cheaper than the internals. On the day I filmed this video, the internal 8 terabyte Seagate drives are $230 a piece. These are $180 a piece. They are $50 a piece less. Now it is worth noting that if you shuck these drives, think of it like shucking an ear of corn, and you take the drive out and you use it externally, you're essentially voiding the warranty. That's fine as far as I'm concerned. I would never use the warranty on these hard drives anyway. When it comes to my sensitive data, and it's not just my videos, but it's other things, I wouldn't use the warranty on a hard drive anyway. If the hard drive failed, I'd simply uh, recycle it and get another one because if you use the warranty on a hard drive, keep in mind, you have to send your hard drive to the manufacturer with your data on it. If they're able to make that drive work again, they then have access to what's written on it. Now it's true in a multi-drive enclosure environment with RAID and parity and data spread around. First of all, they don't probably care. And second of all, uh, it would actually take some real work to get anything, but I'd just as soon not go through the bother. I do take data security very seriously. I've been involved in data security in my previous consulting work. And frankly, when a hard drive fails, you shred the drive because that's the only way to make absolutely sure that the data is completely gone. So. Taking the drives out of the enclosures voids the warranties, but since I'm saving $50 per drive, I can take the savings across eight drives and simply buy an extra drive, put it on the shelf, and I have a spare if I ever need one. So the savings far outweighs any warranty related issues. Now it is worth noting that these are archive hard drives. If you actually plan to use an external enclosure of any kind, this one, others, or even just USB hard drives in general, I would not buy these drives for running programs from. These are very good for archiving and storing data, hence the term archive, but they're very slow for random access and they're very slow for anything other than sequential reading and sequential writing. For $20 more than the cost of these drives, you can buy the eight terabyte external Western Digital MyBook, and it is perfectly suitable for running programs from. Now, why don't I pay the extra $20? This is all bulk storage for me. I'm not running any programs from this, so the $20 save, saved per drive absolutely adds up. The performance of these drives for storing and archiving and backing up data is completely immaterial to me, so long as the CPU utilization is not too high and it has anything remotely approaching reasonable performance, which they certainly do. Now, if you wanna buy Seagate eight terabyte drives and you want them to be fast and have high performance, then you want the uh, NAS drives that they sell, which are currently about $260 for an internal eight terabyte drive. Those are not archive drives. They're not the shingled magnetic recording, much higher performance, but again, they're more expensive for my needs. I just need cheap bulk storage that I can run with parity in a large enclosure to store terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data. Now all that data brings me to why am I doing this in the first place? Well, I'm making a video partly because some people might find it interesting, partly because it gives me an excuse to write all this off as a further business expense because I make a video from it. Some of it is maybe this genuinely helps somebody who has a lot of data they need to store. Either way, uh, I hope it's either entertaining or informative for at least some of you. Now, my data situation. I uh, create, edit, render, and upload 4K videos to YouTube every day. Some are 30 frames per second, some are 60 frames per second. But in general, I render videos at 50 megabits per second when I upload them to YouTube. That's more than YouTube generally needs, but it provides a good quality copy that lets them go to work when they render the nine different resolutions that YouTube uses. This doesn't take into account my original source files, which are up to 100 megabits per second, depending upon whether I'm capturing on the computer or recording with my camera. So I do end up with a lot of data. I keep all of the raw files that were source files for my filming. Now, I don't keep files that I don't use. If I do two or three takes on something or I end up not using footage, I generally don't keep that stuff. But all of the original source files for the final renders to YouTube 
as well as the uploads to YouTube, I keep all of it. You never know when you're going to need that stuff in the future. As you can imagine, it is into the tens of terabytes at this point, even though my channel is only just over a year old. So now that's why I have a lot of data. Why do I need something like this? Why not just plug a couple of external hard drives in and be done with it? If I have 15 to 20 terabytes of space, great. Four of these should cover it, except they don't. And the simple reason is because you don't just store your data in a large RAID 0 stripe. You don't just store it on a, just a bunch of disks. You need parity. You're crazy not to. The biggest single risk that I face is a hard drive failure. And if you have four of these on a RAID 0, a striped array, or even a just a bunch of disks array, if one drive fails, then basically you've lost all of your data. Now you could of course set them up as individual drives and copy files around to different drives, but that's a management headache and then you still lose a lot of data. Now you might say, well great, that's what backups are for. Absolutely, I strongly believe in backups. I have an external 16 terabyte Western Digital My Book du dual drive. Uh, I did a video on that on my channel last year and I do back up my most critical and important data to that but it doesn't hold everything. It's not large enough and it just becomes unwieldy at some point. So to put a long story short, I currently have drives in four different computers storing data. My i7-4770K has four four terabyte drives. My i7-2600K has four three terabyte drives. My i7-6800K, the Broadwell E machine I built on my channel last year has four eight terabyte drives, four of these. And then my Ryzen 7 1700 has several internal and external drives connected to it. Around the house, I have several 3, 4, and 5 terabyte external drives that I've picked up on daily deals at various points, sometimes very cheaply if you pick up, uh, you know, either flash sales that Amazon has or Black Friday sales. Anytime I see a deal, I think, you know, I could always use another hard drive. So I have data stored all over the place. My external backups are on three different computers. It is an absolute mess. Now, this was not like this when I started my YouTube channel. It was much more manageable. But my data set has grown well beyond 20 terabytes at this point. And please note, I have data besides just what's on my YouTube channel. Uh, things that I film for my family, personal stuff, things that my wife has for her work. And so our total data load has grown and grown. By far, the bulk of it, more than 50% of that data, is YouTube, and the percentage of YouTube volume is growing due to the volume of videos that I make. But managing it, making sure everything's backed up, making sure everything's secure, it's rapidly turning into a headache and something that I'm having to actively manage. Now, I understand that the average person is not going to go out and spend $270 on an external enclosure that then requires they go buy more hard drives, especially when the drives come in enclosures and you could just plug them in. As I said before, not for most people. The value for me in this is not the cheapest possible solution, which would be plugging all these in directly to the computer. It's about management headaches. It's about the fact that I can get eight drives into one enclosure. It's the fact that I can get 16 drives into two of them. And I can put all of them on one card in one computer. This deal is not about the cheapest possible solution. Although I did go in a budget route here because I could have gone with a NAS and I could have done a few other things. I could have set up a Linux server. This is less expensive than any of those options. But what it does do is give me the ability to put 16 drives externally on a single computer and easily be able to swap drives out without having 16 external drives or trying to get a computer case with room for 16 drives, which exists, but it's expensive and rare and frankly makes these look reasonably priced. And then of course, when you wanna change drives, you have to open up your whole computer. Here I can change drives without touching my production machine and that has value as well. Rule number one, when you make money with your computer, don't touch it for anything if you can avoid it. Side note worth mentioning, I've mentioned that this is $270 several times. I'll link to it down in the video description below to Amazon and Newegg if you'd like to check it out. They also make a four bay version of this for $99, which is extremely reasonably priced. If you do have three or four external hard drives and you don't like the clutter and you want something that's a bit neater and easier to manage, for $99 you can get a four drive version of this, both USB 3.0 supported and SATA, so you don't have to mess with this if you don't want, just plug in the USB 3 port. And then you can just put all of your drives into that if you're interested. For $350, for just a bit more than this, they offer a version of this with built-in hardware RAID support. 
or sort of hardware write support. Essentially, this is a, just a bunch of disks array. This will represent the eight drives installed to the operating system. There's no built-in RAID functionality, but for $350, you get a version of this that has built-in support for RAID 0, 1, 5, and 10. Why didn't I buy that version? Because I use Windows storage spaces. Now, the hardware RAID built into this does have benefits. It removes the actual RAID array and the assembly of the RAID from Windows. And then if you put all the eight of the drives into a single large array, then just one drive appears to Windows and you just manage it as if it was one drive. Here's the downside to doing that. First of all, you're married to the enclosure. You can't take the drives out of the enclosure, put them in another machine and read them. Generally, when you create a hardware RAID with an enclosure like this, the only place you can read them is that enclosure. Now, you could get a separate enclosure. If, if this enclosure failed for any reason, you could always get another one of these, take the drives out, put it in it, but you are limited to that. With Windows storage spaces, you're not. You can take the drives out of this and put them in anything, and Windows will read them. Windows will read them whether they're plugged into SATA, USB. Windows is not that picky, actually, when you pull the drives out of something like this. Furthermore, Windows Storage Spaces offers the ability to grow and shrink the array more flexibly than Hardware RAID does. Now, there are many Hardware RAID solutions which do allow you to grow and shrink them. Generally, the budget options don't. You have to get into dedicated real Hardware RAID cards, which frankly, the cards all by themselves cost more than $350. You could spend $500 to $1,000 on the really fancy Hardware RAID cards if you really want to go fancy. I'm, I'm not there yet. One of these days, I'll get there. But you, if you've ever watched uh, Linus Tech Tips in his big, he recently built a petabyte storage array and he's got the big rack mount cases, for example. He's got dedicated hardware RAID cards in there that cost more than everything you see on the desk just for his RAID cards, not to mention the hard drives and the enclosures. But of course, he has very different needs than I do. This is a very good starting point to get off just external drives and into something like this. Windows Storage Spaces has another feature which is really nice that almost no hardware RAID supports, which is the ability to include drives of different sizes in the array. Now, I mentioned before that I have four four terabyte drives, four three terabyte drives on two different machines, both older i7s. I have several three, four, and five terabyte external drives attached to various machines. I have several of these eights. What in the world are you gonna do with all that? I'm glad you asked. Let's talk about that for a minute. Now, on the desk here is one, two, three, four, five, six, eight terabyte external drives. These are all currently going for about $180, but I am, of course, your deal man, and so I didn't pay that much. If you watch my live streams on Prime Day back on July 11, these were all running in about the $155 to $160 range, so they were discounted they get discounted on a regular basis. If you're not in a hurry to buy them, add them to your shopping cart and then click save for later. Every time you go into Amazon, every time you're doing your shopping, if the price changes, you'll get a little notification that pops up that says your price has changed. You can also add them to a watch list on Amazon which sends you notification either when they're back in stock or the price changes, etc. A number of things that I'm not in a hurry to buy, but I'm waiting for a special price. I'll generally have anywhere between 10 or 15 items in my Amazon shopping cart in the saved for later section. I usually keep several items over on my wish list on Newegg as well. I try to buy things when I don't need them because then I can wait for the very best price. In any case, so here's how this is going to work. I'm going to put six of these drives into this enclosure, leaving two bays free. I'm gonna set them up, test them, read to them, write to them, make sure everything's working. I'm gonna use it for several days, possibly a week. I wanna stress test it and make sure the enclosure is reliable and the drives are reliable before I put any data on it. Then I am going to copy all of the data that is currently on my Broadwell E machine, which is four eight terabyte drives onto these drives. Once that goes well, I'll start copying the data over from my older arrays, my three terabyte drives and my four terabyte drives to these. Once that is done, then I can take two of the eight terabyte drives out of my Broadwell E machine and stick them in here. Now the array is gonna be six eight terabyte drives that you see here. I go into Windows Storage Spaces and I grow the array. Now I'm gonna be using Parity, which does give up a portion of your drive space, but it does mean that you can afford to lose any one hard drive and you don't lose any data, which is important because while I have backups, 
you don't want to have to go through with that if, if you can avoid it. It's better to have both backups and RAID or Parity to make sure that your data is safe. Once I do all that, once I'm happy with this enclosure, I'm going to order a second one. Assuming that I'm happy with it, everything works great, I'm happy with the performance, the usage, and everything's good, I'm gonna order a second enclosure. Note throughout this entire process, I'm not fully committed. I will not be dedicated to using this until I'm completely happy with it and none of the older rays will be taken down until this is up and running, running great for me. Very important when you're in a, a professional production environment. I mean, I make my living from YouTube, so I need to make sure that I'm never in a position where my new solution is having problems and I've taken apart my old solution. That's why my Skylake X build is gonna be a fresh build. I could absolutely take my old Broadwell E-Machine, take the motherboard out uh, with the CPU, put the new uh, motherboard, the new CPU into that case and migrate in place. What if it doesn't work? That's where all my files are stored. Don't migrate in place always build new and then swap over once it's working. If your business or your livelihood depends upon your machine, don't take down your working computer until the new one is in place working fine and you've tested it. So back to the storage, buying another one of these. I'm gonna take the four four terabyte drives from my i7-4770, and I'm gonna take the four three terabyte drives from my i7-2600K, and I'm gonna put them in the second enclosure. Now, those of you who are really good at math will immediately discover what the financial problem with what I just described is from a dollars to storage ratio. Spending $270 on an external enclosure to put four three terabyte drives, especially used drives, and four four terabyte drives doesn't make a lot of sense. In fact, it would in many ways be cheaper just to get a couple of external eight terabyte drives or uh, the four drive enclosure but it's not necessarily about the lowest price. It's about convenience. And to explain that, we have to circle back around to Windows Storage Spaces. I mentioned that Windows Storage Spaces will allow you to have arrays of different size drives. You don't have to have all eight terabyte or four terabyte or three terabyte drives. I will be able to take four four terabytes and four three terabyte drives, put them in the second enclosure and make one array. All the data will be stored on it, parity will be protected. Now, when the drives are different sizes, it doesn't as efficiently use the space, but it uses most of it. You lose a little bit to the inefficiencies of different sizes, but so long as you have enough drives and eight is, it will work with them well enough. And now we come to the management end of it. I don't intend to keep those eight drives for a long period of time, maybe a year but I already have them, they're already paid for, so there's no need for me to go out and buy eight more of these while I have those drives. They're certainly not worth selling at this point and they have data on them, so I wouldn't sell them. So I will use them for another year or two until they become an issue for storage. When these two new external enclosures become about 75% full, both the eight terabyte drives in here, as well as the three and four terabyte drives in the second enclosure, then it will be time to start buying more drives. But I'll always be on the lookout for deals, sales, bargains, Prime Day, Black Friday specials, etc. Now it might be more eight terabyte drives or we're probably looking in Christmas 2018 or possibly early 2019, perhaps the 10 or 12 terabyte drives will be cheaper. If I come across a good deal on those, I might buy two 12 terabyte drives. What I will do at that point is retire two of the three terabyte drives. Windows Storage Spaces gives you the ability to go and select a drive, or two in this case, and remove them from the array. It will move all the data off. This is why you don't want to be over 75% full. It'll move all the data off those two drives while maintaining parity and protection. It might take a day or two to actually do that. So this isn't something you want to do when you're on a sharp deadline notice, but it will move all of the data off there and spread it around your remaining drives. Once this is complete, it'll give you a notice that those drives are safe to remove. I'll then pull those two drives out, take my new two uh, 12 terabyte drives, put them in place, add them to the array, and then rebalance. Windows Storage Spaces gives you the option to rebalance the data and it will then shuffle the data back across those drives. Now fast forward perhaps six months later, my channel's growing, I'm making lots of videos, now I need more storage. I go find a deal on the next two 12 terabyte drives. Click retire on the three terabytes, pull them out, put in the 12s, we're good to go. Maybe six months after that, a year after that, 16 terabyte drives are inexpensive. Isn't technology grand? Now it's time to start retiring the four terabyte drives. 
I can do this one or two, just for convenience, I can probably do them two at a time, but you could do them one drive at a time and work your way up in size. Once the original three and four terabyte drives are retired, that's probably gonna be several years from now. Assuming I'm still growing data, these are gonna to start to feel small. Maybe 20 or 25 terabyte drives are out then. It'll then be time to start retiring these drives. And the process continues. This is the benefit of Windows storage spaces, and this is the benefit of having all these drives in two standalone enclosures that are easy to manage that are in one spot. Trying to do what I just described with drives spread across four different computers around my house is an absolute management nightmare. It has been challenging to keep track of it. That is why paying $270 for this and then ultimately $270 for the next one makes sense. It lets me consolidate all the data, make sure that it's all protected via parity, backed up externally. Oh, that reminds me. I mentioned I would take two of the eight terabyte drives from the Broadwell E machine and put them in here, but that leaves two more unaccounted for. I already have two external eight terabyte drives in my Western Digital MyBook Duo enclosure, which I mentioned before. Those two drives will also be stuck in an extra set of external enclosures that I have, and those will be external backup drives for my most critical data. Now, I currently back up the files that I upload to YouTube. I do not actually have a local backup copy of my original raw source files. They are gigantic and it would be expensive to back them up. Now, all of my data is backed up to Backblaze, which brings up another wonderful subject. Side note, Backblaze, $5 a month per computer, link down in the bottom of the description below. I pay for Backblaze. They don't sponsor me, they don't pay me any money, but that is an affiliate link. I get paid a small referral fee if you sign up, but I don't have a relationship with them. I was a customer with Backblaze before I started a YouTube channel. I have been extremely happy and they have saved my bacon several times since I have been a customer. So I am a happy customer. It does work, $5 per computer. It's a very low uh, powered client. It doesn't mess up your machine. I can be editing video. I can be rendering video. The backup still works and it's quick. It's not throttled. Now I have a good connection, but I am able to back up new files that I create often within one or two hours of creating them. So there's not days and days of upload time. Highly recommend it. Check that link out below, two week free trial. And if you sign up, it helps me out. So all of my data is backed up online with Backblaze, but for local backups, I only have the uploaded copies because it would simply be very, very expensive to have everything else. Eventually I'd like to have everything else backed up locally, but for now, just that. And of course, all my other personal documents and stuff are backed up on external drives as well as being backed up with Backblaze. Backups, they're important. If you haven't lost a hard drive yet, it's just a matter of time. I'm gonna do two more things in this video. I'm going to shuck one of these drives for you live to show you how much not fun it is. And then I'm gonna open this up and show you what comes in the box. After I build my Skylake X system, which is the next build coming up on my channel, I will put the drives in here. I will connect it to the machine. And in terms of the Windows performance review portion of the Skylake X build, this will be included. So when it comes to that video, if you're going, what in the world is he talking about? Well, I'll have the box in the background, but this is what's going to be in there. I'll be testing performance on it with USB 3.0. I'll be testing it with the SATA ports to show you the difference as well as CPU utilization. I'll be setting up the Windows storage spaces to show you how the, that'll all be in the Skylake X build. So if you're interested in that, make sure you subscribe to my channel to be notified when those videos come out. All right, that's entirely enough talking. Let's open up one of these. Let's see if I could do this in one take. On the plus side, if I completely screw it up, I have several more drives to make an attempt on a video with, but I'm gonna try to do this without interruption. We'll see how it goes. I might end up trimming it and editing it in case some of it's boring or I'm fighting with it, but who knows, maybe it'll be easy. Usually it's not. My experience of shucking drives is that the first one is the hard one. And if you're doing several of them, you can get into a pattern once you figure out how to open them. I don't think I've ever shucked one of the Seagate modern external enclosures. I've done the Western Digitals. I did one of these a while ago, uh, two years ago, but they changed the enclosures from time to time. What's in here? Power adapter. And no, generally um, you can't save the enclosures. They Oftentimes you destroy them in the process of opening them. Here we go. And Seagate Expansion Desktop, desktop yeah, pff, I can't speak. Seagate Expansion Desktop Drive for your PC, Quick Start Guide. Yeah, it's called Plug It Into Your Computer. Really, if you're gonna buy one of these and use it externally, if you just need a local backup of one drive, it really couldn't be easier. Plug in the power adapter, plug in the USB cable, put it in your computer, voila, you're done. 
and we'll open up this plastic here. We'll just tear the plastic, shall we? And of course, there are no screws or indicators whatsoever. If you ever have a consumer level product and it doesn't seem like there's an obvious way to get into it, generally, that's because the way to get into it is under the product label, which of course you avoid the warranty when you open up, but I don't really care because I would never warranty these drives. And so, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take off these rubber feet. Now, sometimes it's under the rubber feet. I'm just using the knife. These are just, <laughs> these are pretty cheap. Those came off really easily. Let's see if we can get under here. Now, I could, if I was intelligent, I could go on to YouTube and I'll bet you there's a video of how to shuck these. I have not looked. I am actually trying this without having done one and I'm recording it because we're gonna see how it goes. And it might be terrible, who knows. But if you're watching this, then I kept it. And if you're not, well, then I didn't. And there's absolutely nothing under that label. Wonderful. Nothing under there. Well, I thought I would try. You never know. There is a lip here. Yes, I should go look up a YouTube video, but now you, I might I might actually compress the speed of some of this. I'll like put it at normal speed when I'm talking and then when I'm sitting here not saying anything, I'll put it at like 300% speed. Come on, baby, you know you wanna open. Okay, that sounds totally wrong. I'll, I'll just not say that. Sorry. You know, I probably should get a screwdriver. Always have lots of tools. See if this works. Hopefully I'm not making too many funny facial expressions as I'm doing this. Boy, they really don't want you to open this. It's probably just snapped together. I mean, it's just, once they put it together, it's just put together with snaps and I'm probably going at it from the wrong angle. I mean, I can see where the lip is. I can see where the, uh, see why you really can't reuse these containers. You're gonna break it opening it. Good Lord. Come on, manufacturers, don't make your stuff like this. I don't wanna sit here and say, in my day, we could service the stuff we bought. I remember the first VCR that my dad owned. It was one of those humongous console uh, style units that was big and tall. It had the wood grain on the front and the tape didn't go in the front. It actually had the big thing that popped up and you put the tape in and then you had to push it down. When you hit eject, it popped up. Yeah, that thing was insanely big and expensive, but you could get that fixed. And we had to, a couple of times it broke and we, there was actually electronic repair stores that existed back then. And you would take it down to the local shop and you'd leave it with him for the afternoon. And usually the next day he'd call you up and you know, whatever was wrong with it, you know, he had it fixed and you paid him something and off you went. And then the prices of all that dropped to the point to where it just didn't make any financial sense. I mean, just, you just throw it away and buy another one for the same price as getting it fixed. And the new one had more features and was faster and smaller and all those repair shops are gone now. Okay, I'm gonna look up how to open this. And we're back. I had to go downstairs and get my uh, Vision Tech 26 piece toolkit because I need really small screwdrivers. Even this little thing, which is an old Craftsman, is too large. It really takes something very small to get in here. Yes, you are going to, uh, to ruin this, there we go. You are going to ruin this to get in there. And yes, I should probably have the camera closer and be doing this on the overhead, but there are a bunch of clips holding this on. And yes, I did end up watching a YouTube video because frankly, I didn't wanna really pry too hard unless I was sure and this is the joy of YouTube. Come on. Then we take our larger one, stick it in there, yep. That is nuts. Oh, okay, there's a second lip in there. It really is an awful design. Seagate. Now, some of you may say, doesn't it at some point make sense to buy internal drives? Well, whoa, hang on. Some of you may ask, is all this insanity worth it to save a bit of money? Eight times 50 is $400. So if it takes me three hours to open eight drive, well, six drives, but I'll eventually have eight. $300 saved for six drives? It could take me all day to open these and it would be worth the savings. You know, one thing that I should really have
Oh, wow. Okay. That just came right out. And it broke a bunch of the clips getting that out. I wonder if Seagate has a special tool to open this because a bunch of these clips, the retaining clips, all got snapped pulling this out. Now the challenge is to get the drive out of here, which actually might be as simple as... Oh, that was pretty straightforward. Nothing in here. I mean, it literally is just a piece of plastic holding the drive. And then there are some rubber shock mounts stuck over these screws, which go into where the drive mounts, which I'm not going to need. And then there's some type of electrostatic foil thingy back here. And then you can see there is a USB to SATA connector, which we simply need to remove. And it's actually screwed in. But there we go. That's actually a flathead, and that's a Phillips, but it doesn't matter because I got it out. No, you really can't reuse it. Next expansion, ASM 1153. So, Seagate charges less money for the external drive. They have to provide the external enclosure. They have to provide the hub. They have to provide a power adapter, which I'm not even going to use. Also, I can get to the Seagate archive, archive hard drive, which in fact you can see it says archive right on there, eight terabytes. Now, if you actually ran this serial number, it probably would say that's not a valid serial number because it was never meant to be taken out. Now I have five more of them to do, which don't worry, I won't put on video. But essentially, when you wanna take one of these things out, at least for the modern Seagate, and this is true for the five terabyte and four terabyte drives, you need either um, a very, very, very small flathead screwdriver you know, a credit card might work as well, or perhaps a pocket knife. My box cutter is not strong enough. It was just bending the blade, so that won't do it. But if you had a stronger knife, uh, you might be able to get it in there. Once you get in, it's just a matter of prying it away and then just don't be afraid to break, break the plastic because now basically we have a bunch of plastic to recycle. I'm going to clean this up and then we're going to take this out of the box. And just like that, the mess is all cleaned up the magic of video editing. I'll push that aside. Well, you know what? I'll go ahead and open this up. These are less than about $15 or so. It's a very simple, straightforward card. And as you can see, it says Media Sonic right on it. So my hope is that it works very well with this, given the fact that it is basically sold for that. We'll open this up. And inside, there is nothing. Wow, absolutely nothing. There is a screw to put it in your case. And then we have a very simple card. And that's it. That's a PCI Express 1X card. And actually, if that's a 1X card, you know, it may be a SATA 6 gigabit per second, and there's two of them. And yeah, with PCI Express 1X, you're never really going to get the full bandwidth. But with archive hard drives, who cares? It's mostly the lower CPU utilization of this that I'm interested in. That is a very small chip. Anyway, that's what that is. I'll set that aside. And now we come to the main event. This is a fairly large box, and we shall open this up. No, I have not opened this up yet. I don't know what's inside of here. Hopefully, hopefully it's an eight drive enclosure. Oh, we'll have to cut all the tape back here. I suppose I could have pre-cut it, but, you know, at some point this just becomes fun, hopefully, for some of you, especially for my long-time viewers interested in something like this. And there's more tape to cut. If you see little cuts in these videos, it's just because I'm trying to make it more watchable. Now we will open this up, and, oh, boy, there's lots of flaps. What do we have inside here? I'll tilt this over, hopefully without everything falling out. A bag of stuff. I'll turn it towards the camera so you can see it. Yeah, I know, it's exciting, isn't it? What's in here? We have a cardboard box, a cardboard, a piece of cardboard, yay. It actually looks like I can just turn this upside down, just like so. There we go. Oh, very nice. Nothing left in the box. And it is upside down, but we will undo the tape here. 
using the tried and true tear method. One of the neat tricks to opening up boxes, especially when you turn them upside down like this, is if you can get them upside down on the foam, open the bottom plastic, the feet are here, and then I can simply take it and turn it right side up, hopefully carefully. I don't want to become uh, tech drop deals. Sorry, Linus. And then we take the plastic off and it's an external enclosure. There are little protective plastic bits that I'll need to peel off, but hey, that actually looks pretty nice. That's not too big. Now, imagine having eight separate of those external enclosures with eight power adapters and eight sets of cables, and then you either have to stack them up or have a shelf or put them on the floor, and then you have a big mess. Here you have a single enclosure, and when I add a second one, we're talking about a fairly com compact space. They'll sit next to each other under the desk next to my computer. For cooling, there are two fans built into it right here, which is nice to keep the drives cool. And there's a power button on the front and an interface and a mode button. Uh, from reading the documentation, there is a fan button here and the fan is controllable. It, you can either leave the fan on automatic or you can turn the fan up or down depending upon what you want. And I don't know if you can see it right here. I'll bring it forward. There is a external SATA plug and a USB uh, hub plug right here to connect to your case. In fact, there may be, there are, there are cables in here. There's a lock for the front and then you can see, see, now this is nice. I really like this. Standard three pin power connector. It's the same thing as a normal computer case. What's nice about that is you don't have to worry about losing the power cord. There's way too many devices that I have to hunt down and try to find the device specific power cord. This means I can use any power cord. I don't have to worry about it. That's very nice. How heavy is it? It is, oh, it's not too bad. When it's filled with hard drives, it'll be much heavier. Opening up the bag, let's see what we have inside. Here is a USB 3 cable with the port for your computer on one end and the port for this on the other. Oh, very nice. It comes with an external SATA cable. I thought you might have to buy one of those. You might still have to buy one depending upon the length. That's, I don't know if that's long enough, but we'll see. We have a power cable, sweet. Always nice to have an extra power cable. And then here we have, are these for the drives or the front trays? There are keys. Wonderful keys to give you the illusion of security. Bring this around. <laughs> yeah, this keeps the innocent out. This isn't going to keep out. Is that locked? Maybe it was unlocked. I kid you not, I actually had to read the manual to figure out how to open the thing. You have to turn the key, then turn it past, and then push in and release because it's on the, yeah. Anyway, so opening it's a bit interesting, but so be it. Now I'm gonna turn this towards you so you can see inside of it. Now, it turns out that what these are, are hard drive handles. Well, it wouldn't be my first choice, but since these are gonna be changed very rarely, I can live with it. You screw these hard drive handles onto the drive. There's no actual trays. There's no hot, this is not a hot swap enclosure. You're not meant to change these drives very often. If you change the drive, it's because it's failed or you're upgrading. So ideally you put the drives in and it's gonna be three, four plus years before you change them. So there are screws in here and you have to screw one of these onto the actual screw holes of the drive and then the drives can actually slide into place. It's $270 and it holds eight drives. I challenge you to find an external eight drive enclosure with decent hot swap bays for anything close to this price point. While these handles are awkward, I will say that I'll give them credit for a couple of things. The instructions are pretty simple. Once I, I sat there and fiddled around with it for a bit, <laughs> and then I opened up the instructions and it was fairly straightforward. Furthermore, do I like these little plastic handles they have you screw on? No, not really, but eh, it is what it is. Look at the price. Now, they do provide a small miniature screwdriver if you don't have one, which is a nice touch. Now, frankly, Nobody buying this should not have a toolkit. If you're buying a $270 external enclosure bay, I would hope that you have proper size tools, but I'm using the one they provided to see how that works. We'll see. 
So I've screwed a handle onto the one drive that I took off. There's a little symbol that says up, it's up. That's interesting. There are two rubber shock mounts here on the handle, which I imagine push against this. It looks like it. Let's see if I slide one of these in here. Yeah, wow, that is, uh, that is budget. But now can I close the door? No. Did I not get it in the right spot? I did get it in the right spot. Interesting. Okay, another cuts because some more fiddling, but I had to play with it. So basically you slide the drive in here. The handle, if I can do this, pops out and the drive slides out just like that. Push the handle up, push the drive in until it connects. And of course you're not gonna be able to feel it or hear it, but I can. It is connected to um, the SATA and power ports in the back. Then this closes, it will push against it. There are pads here and then there's pads on the handle. Make sure the handle is up. You then close it and you actually screw this closed. This is not a hot swap enclosure. This is a permanent solution, but that's okay. I am fine with that because I'm gonna be using it as a, per oh, I'm gonna be using it as a permanent solution. When I put these hard drives in here, they'll stay in here for at least three years. When I take them out, they'll be taken out either because they failed or because I'm retiring them to replace them with 20 terabyte hard drives or whatever comes next. So let me reiterate once again that this is not about the least expensive way to add storage to your computer. These could all be plugged in directly. I don't, you don't need this. The benefit to this is to provide a way to add a large number of drives in a relatively small space connected to two serial ATA ports with lower CPU utilization without having 16 different power adapters and 16 different USB 3 cables with all these drives. It's a way to manage all the data that previously was on six different, uh, four, well, actually six if you count the external hard drives, different computers. I had internal drives in four computers and with external drives at six. Data fun. A couple quick additional notes. There is a hard drive activity light up here, separate ones for uh, USB 3 and for SATA so that you know which is which. There are several control buttons here for the fans, etc. On the back is a Kingston lock port, which lets you run one of those security cables into it. Although frankly, given its size, uh, if this is actually important data, you want better security than that. There's the two fans on the back I mentioned, the two connectors, the power cable, Overall, I'm happy with it. Um, I do think the way the drives install is a little bit, yeah, you know, it's cheap. It definitely is cheap. But seriously, price, eight bay external enclosures. Find something even close to $270. The reality is you won't. I have looked. An eight bay NAS, which with hot swap bays and better management features, they're lovely, but you'll spend $600 to $1,000 on one easily. You're not gonna find one down in this price point. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with the big huge red button directly below this video. Questions and comments in the comment section. Check the links in the video description. The link to this on Amazon and Newegg will be down there. I will also put the link to the four bay version of this. Smaller, simpler, less cumbersome will be down there as well for $99 if you want something more than external drives but less than this. Finally, be sure that you're subscribed to get notified of when my upcoming Skylake X build, my new main production workstation that's gonna have all this data on it. I definitely will include performance information on both USB 3 and SATA on this. I'm gonna be doing a bunch of testing because I do wanna validate it and make sure it's dependable and reliable before I actually commit to moving my data to it. Additionally, at the very bottom of the video description, you will find links to Twitter, Twitch, and Patreon. Please consider supporting me or following me over there if you can. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.